We're going to talk about literature in a half hour. This is everything of the last year that I discovered. I read far too many articles. So it's a literature dive. I don't have enough time to talk about methods. Okay, I just don't. Okay, if you see something you're like, that doesn't seem right, talk to me about it. I'm happy to talk to you about it. My email address is dmccollum at augusta.edu. If you look up my name on YouTube, you will find several of the lectures this time and most of the lectures from last year already posted. Okay, these are all free. Please share them. And this, will, this one will be up in about a week. I have no conflicts of interest at all. Let's, let's get going. So, um, black is going to be for a good article. Blue is going to be for a funny article. Red is a critical article. If you just fall asleep, because it is way too much information that, that we're doing in a half hour, just look for the red slides. So, the CDC opioid guideline, this is huge. This just came out a few months ago. So, for most patients that have acute pain, they should receive less than three days of opioids. That is for most patients. If you're giving them opioids, don't forget, we still have NSAIDs, we have, still have acetaminophen, we got a lot of other ways to treat things for pain other than opioids, less than three, de three days. This is excellent for those people that don't want to be the primary care provider for, for pain, okay? Almost all less than seven days. This is a practice changer for me. I used to have people, they broke their arm or something like that. I was often given a couple weeks worth of Percocet or something like that. I no longer do that. Most things, including fractures, are largely better within five to seven days, most of the time. There are some that need longer stuff, okay? That's fine. The problem with that is those that need longer stuff, they often don't respond well to opioids. They probably need other stuff. These are the folks that need tricyclics. These are the people that might benefit for gabapentin or neurontin. These are not the people that need to be on lifelong Percocet because that kills people. And the last thing is you should almost never use it for chronic pain, okay? One exception, if you have cancer. If you've got cancer, I am going to hook you up. I don't care, all right? You've got pancreatic cancer and you are hurting, I am going to make you feel better, okay? The difference is it's totally different to treat cancer pain than to be treating like back pain. It's much more nebulous. Cancer pain is different, okay? Often we're palliating as opposed to going for curative treatment in these folks. So just keep that in mind. So deaths per year, let's talk about a few things that kill people. You got AIDS, it kills a lot of people, right? These are all in the US, most recent year available, 2013. You say, you know what, homicide, we're talking about that a lot recently in the news. It, it kills more people than AIDS in this country, sure. Then you're like, car crashes. Ah, oh, we all have car crashes, right? See lots of them. Plenty of you guys have taken care of people that have died in car crashes. Oh wait, overdoses? What, what, what happened here? Yeah, that's right. More people are dying from overdoses than car crashes. I want that to sink in. More people are dying due to opioids than AIDS and murder combined in this country. Combined. More people are dying from overdoses than from car crashes, okay? I know a lot of you guys have a long drive home, and I really hope that you're safe. But think about this. Think of how many car crashes you see. Why is this going underreported? It's because people don't see this, okay? A lot of these are the 911 calls of, yeah, I found this guy dead in bed. Oh, it's a no transport, appropriately, right? These aren't the people that we're seeing. We're seeing a very small minority of these. We're seeing the drug seekers. We're seeing the people with chronic pain. You look at their med list and say, wow, you're really taking oxycodone 30 milligrams four times a day? And you're talking to me? This is what's happening. So this is one of my critical articles. I want you to take note of this one. For back pain, okay, you do not have to give opioids to back pain. An excellent study just came out. Naproxen only versus naproxen plus cyclobenzaprine, that's flexoril, okay? Or naproxen plus Percocet, basically, oxycodone acetaminophen. Fewer side effects, same pain relief. But naproxen monotherapy is just as good as those others with fewer side effects. This is not first line. If someone says, I tried naproxen, try a different NSAID, sometimes it's surprisingly effective what you can get from adding a different NSAID as opposed to the same class that they were on before. So mix it up, try meloxicam, try ibuprofen, have a deeper bag of tricks. And increasingly I've been using capsaicin topical, which is an effective treatment that a lot of these people haven't used before, is very effective, not a lot of literature, but a heck of a lot safer than Percocet. All right, so this one's a little bit more fun. Roller coasters for asthma. Turns out that someone actually did a study of seeing if asthma got better with roller coasters. It does. <laughs> so they actually improved dyspnea after you got on a roller coaster, which is awesome. Unfortunately, my emergency department's a little tightly packed, so uh, I think I'm going to just stick with albuterol for now. But, but keep in mind, maybe you just need to, like, I don't know, spin them around in a wheelie chair or something for a second. Next up is the Procameo trial, okay? 
So this just in, amiodarone sucks. There is almost no indication that I think amiodarone is the best agent for it, okay? The possible exception is AFib with RVR in a hypotensive patient. That is about the only time that I'm reaching for it first. There's a lot of cardiologists that love this drug. I can't stand it. It's great in that if you have no idea what's happening on the EKG, most of the time it's kinda sorta okay. Uh, check that QTC, but, but most of the time it's all right, okay? It treats a lot of dysrhythmias, but it doesn't treat any of them well. So we have people with suspect, suspected VTAC. They have procainamide versus amiodarone, and procainamide stomped it, okay? If you're not using procainamide, or maybe your hospital doesn't have it, you need to get it. It's an oldie, but a goodie, okay? It makes some people a little bit hypotensive. It does some screwy things with the QRS. Learn about it, learn to love it. It's amazing. And every time that they study procainamide versus another drug for VTAC, it beats it. The only thing that might be better than that is Edison Medicine, which is just shocking them out of it. So if you don't have procainamide, think about that instead. So next one, apple juice. This is just a gem of a study. I don't know why I didn't get more press. So how many people in here have ever drank Pedialyte? Okay, I really encourage you to go get a bottle and you will find out how absolutely disgusting it is. I have drank some really gross things in my life. And my favorite beer in college was Steel Reserve and I can't drink Pedialyte. I just can't, it is awful. It's like evil seawater. And what do we give to kids when they're dehydrated and you're doing the responsible thing? You're like, we don't wanna stab your kid with an IV. We just wanna you know, orally rehydrate, good for you. And so you're like, oh, let's try this Pedialyte. It is disgusting, okay? It is absolutely awful. So they did a study of half drink apple juice. So one to one dilution. So half water, half apple juice and it raffle stomped them. It just destroyed Pedialyte. And the reason was, is kids are actually willing to drink it. So don't do a biochemistry lecture and say, oh, the glucose and the sodium and this co-transport. I don't care. If you don't drink it, it doesn't matter, okay? So if you have this perfect physiologic fluid, if there's parents from like, yeah, the kid keeps wanting to drink sweet tea and they have gastroenteritis, go to town, enjoy yourself some sweet tea. Because that is much better than this, you know, physiologic perfect fluid that's gonna be great. You know, they shouldn't drink gallons and gallons of it. But let them alternate, mix it up, because if they're actually drinking something, it's better than nothing. This actually prevented hospitalizations and saved a lot of kids from IVs. So throw out all the Pedialyte and uh, start mixing up apple juice in those awesome little plastic cups that I'm assuming every ER has. They're, they're just awesome. Next up is a patch trial and platelets. This is one you're going to have to talk to some people about. So not, not that kind of patch, different patch. It is about spontaneous hemorrhage of the brain. Okay, so you got a brain bleed, all right, you're on antiplatelets, makes all the sense in the world that you should be giving platelets, right? You know, you're poisoning your platelets with one of these agents. Shouldn't we be replacing those platelets with this fresh bag? And the answer is shockingly no, all right? And if you ask anybody why this is the case and they give you a reason, they're lying because nobody knows. Like I have no idea why this trial got the results that it did, but they're twice as likely to die. Turns out blood is dirty. Okay, and platelets are the dirtiest blood product you can give. They're much more unsafe than PRBCs. They're much more unsafe than FFP. And study after study shows that unless you really need to be giving platelets to someone, don't do it. It's probably something about mumble mumble, pro-inflammatory cascade. I have no idea, but I can tell you that almost every neurosurgeon you're gonna talk to and you say, hey, yeah, they're on an antiplatelet, they're gonna say, give them a six pack of platelets. They're gonna get, get that phoresis pack in there and you need to talk to them about this. Ideally, you're gonna to talk to them about this before you get on the phone to transfer them somewhere because this is a really awkward conversation, <laughs> okay? So just don't give platelets the brain bleeds. All right, next one. So Steve Shiver gave an excellent talk on epistaxis, but he was missing a key method of stopping nosebleeds, and that is bacon. Yep, yep, bacon. Yeah, this is exactly what you think. Yeah, that, that ominous like, oh, I don't like where this is going, no. Bacon for epistaxis. This is one of my favorite sentences that I read this year in the literature. To our knowledge, this represents the first description of nasal packing with strips of cured pork for treatment of life-threatening hemorrhage in a patient with glansman thrombostinia. Yeah, I bet it is. I, I, bet, I bet that is, to your knowledge, the first description of that. They basically shoved bacon up someone's nose, and it worked. Should you do this? No, do not do this. I recommend TXA instead. Figure out whatever it is that you're gonna be doing, be that the rhino rocket, okay, be that the mirror seal or whatever. Add some TXA to the mix. The literature's not great on this. I've personally had some pretty good results. The literature's kind of mixed, not a lot of great study. You don't have a lot to lose. So it's very easy to add TXA to that other stuff. You can coat it on, on the outside of a rhino rocket. You can shoot it into a mirror seal. It's good stuff. All right, next up, 
Had some awesome pediatric talks earlier today. Uh, how many people are familiar with the term alti? Yeah, yeah, well, now they're calling it brewy because they just can't help themselves, okay? And, and basically, a brewy is an alti that they had the guidelines updated for. I don't know why they changed the terminology, they just did. But basically, we have this brief event, it got better, we don't know what happened to your kiddo, and the kid looks good again. That's a brewy now. There's a lot of variation for people, okay? Some people will have, like, my kid turned blue for eight seconds, I have no idea what happened, and they will get the full show, okay? They get blood cultures, huge amount of blood work, they get admitted for a day or two. Some people, like me, do very little for most of these people. The guidelines are all over the place until now, which is basically don't do a lot, okay? If they're not high risk, most of the time you don't need any real testing. What is high risk? If they're under two months old, do not trust them. Little babies are liars and they are there to, to burn you, okay? If, if a kid that's under four weeks in particular looks at me funny, he's getting an LP because I hate them, okay? And you need to watch out for them because they will burn you. If they have abnormal vitals, you cannot have a febrile alti or a febrile brewy, okay? That is something else that sepsis is still proven otherwise. So it's something else, okay? You got a fever, you got tachycardia, anything other than that kid looks fantastic, you need to be thinking of something else. Family history of sudden death is a subtle one that you could miss. That's particularly relevant if they were young, okay, or if it was unexplained. A little bit less relevant if their 75-year-old grandfather passed away. Not, not as big of a deal, okay? But if they have a brother who died at 12 while playing basketball, take note, there could be something underlying it. An event that lasts over one minute, be cautious, okay? This should be on the order of seconds that something funny happened. You know, if, if they're not breathing right for 90 seconds, get worried. And then CPR by anyone that knows what they're doing, okay? If the paramedics at any point thought we should give chest compressions or bag the kid or something like that, stop. This is not a brewy. This could have been transient cardiac arrest. And then last, if they're repeat events or if the kid's ill appearing. But if all these are okay, you essentially don't need to do anything. Their only real recommendations is to teach uh, or to get the family plugged in with how they can learn how to do CPR, which has nothing to do with what this is and everything to do with just the fact that parents should know how to do CPR. So yesterday we had that awesome procedure lab. This is an important set of guidelines that is one of the rare times that anesthesiologists actually came up with guidelines that I like about the airway. This is big. Basically, it's plan A, B, C, and D. A is that thing that you were gonna try to do to begin with. You're trying to intubate the patient. DL, VL, I don't care how you're getting it done, just get it done. Okay, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you got, maybe use a bougie, big fan. Plan B, is that you actually use a supraglottic device, which is a long way of saying LMA, which is technically a brand name. But whatever it is that you got, you got the IGLs, you got the air cues, don't care, something that just throw it in the back of the throat and bag that way, okay? If all you got is combi tubes, use combi tubes. This is the thing that, that a lot of people that don't see a lot of airways forget about. They just go straight to bag valve mask, which is actually a technically difficult procedure. So if you're in trouble, you can't get the tube, things aren't going well, throw in an LMA. Plan C is actually bag valve mask, okay? This is a little bit weird for people. That, that most people are probably doing that plan B. Do that plan C, okay? If you can't get it the seat right or something like that, you probably don't need it. And plan D is a surgical crike. Plan D is a surgical crike. Plan D is a surgical crike. Don't use the needle kits. They're too slow, and if you don't know what you're doing with them, they won't work. So let's talk about LMAs got really controversial recently. There was a study that showed that there was poor um, blood flow in a pig model going to the brain. So there was questions about whether it was safe to actually use LMAs in adults. But it turns out that pigs are not people, okay? There's a recent study that showed excellent blood flow in humans that were getting MRIs for other reasons. So that's fine, okay? If you're responding to a code on the floor or something like that, totally okay to throw in an LMA while you're running the code. What you don't wanna be doing if someone is coding is to be mucking around with the airway, trying to intubate, having bad compressions, or heaven forbid, say stop compressions because I see cords but I can't do it. Stop that. Throw in an LMA and run the rest of your code. It is much easier. If the code gets really long and you're doing multiple rounds and for whatever reason you're continuing for 15 or 20 minutes, you can go back and try that airway. Pull out the LMA, give it a whirl, okay? But do not stop compressions in order to be ventilating your patient. Just get an LMA. So even though pigs are not people, some people are pigs, and just to alienate the rest of the crowd, equal opportunity joke, she's also terrible. I don't know what happened there. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. So, so basically, <laughs> oh, 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 geez. Uh, so basically, it's going to be safe. Have that in your back pocket, okay? 
So the other part is that do not use a needle kit. They're just too slow. If any of you guys ever pulled out the kit, there's like 95 parts in it. You're like, what's that wire doing? What's that little bitty scalpel that I hate? It, it's a garbage kit. It wasn't made for us. So what do I recommend? It's scalpel, finger, bougie. So scalpel, you cut the neck, okay? I prefer to do a cruciate cut, basically a vertical incision followed by a horizontal. If they're super skinny, maybe you can get by with just a horizontal. I just think that the vertical one's a good idea unless you're really comfortable with it. Find the spot and at least have that horizontal incision, okay? Next up, finger. You get your finger in there. This is a very rude procedure. You're diving your finger in there and it should be, uh, it should be trapped in a cartilaginous cage, okay? There shouldn't be anywhere for it to go any other direction. You have your finger in the airway and every side of it, you're gonna feel cartilage. You know you're there. The problem here is you gotta get your finger out of there. And if you pull your finger out of there, I can tell you from experience, you're gonna have nothing but blood, you're not gonna see where you are, and it's very easy to get that tube in the wrong place. What do you do? You put a bougie in there. You take that beautiful blue stick, you shove it in there, it glides right past your finger while your finger is still there, okay? And now you know exactly where you are in the airway, and then you railroad the tube over, okay? Much, much safer than trying anything else, and this is quick. So don't bring a needle to a knife fight. So this is another one of those, man, this, this one should have got a lot more press. So basically, you know, we tried all these different things and when Toradol is really just not working, apparently you can randomize people. This was not a blinded study for those of you that are asking. I think the people knew that they were having sex at least three times per week. But one group was randomized to have sex at least three times per week. One group was given Tamsulosin, and the third group, I just feel bad for these guys. They were just told, you can't have sex, you don't get Tamsulosin, just, that, we hate you, right? So this, this really happened, and, <laughs> and the problem is, the, these folks were not randomized at all. I can, I can believe some of the guys in one of the groups were just like, yeah, the, sure, the kidney cell passed, but it, they actually had double the passage rate. Okay, it actually seems to work. Now, sure, is this a sexist study that it only studied men? What about all those ladies with kidney stones? Yeah, it, it's true, but it, this is impressive data. It was only one study. I don't know if it's gonna get repeated, but it's awesome. So, so here's my completely made up graph of men that were faking kidney stones. They're like, we don't want Percocet. We don't want anything. Like, I just want that doctor's note. I want those discharge instructions written down and then here are the number of partners faking migraines. <laughs> very similar curves, very similar. All right, next up, dopamine is dead. I know back in the day people kept saying, hey, let's try some dopamine and maybe it's safer, maybe it's renal protective. That is garbage flavored garbage, okay? It is not true, okay? It's not true in humans, it's not true in pigs, it's not true in aardvarks, okay? I don't give dopamine anymore. I don't know who it's for. And here's why, okay? They actually did a study in a Brazilian PICU. And sure, you're gonna say, oh, it's in Brazil. Sure, it's in a PICU, sure. It's not an emergency department in Georgia where I practice. I don't care. This is the only randomized controlled trial that compared sepsis in kids with dopamine versus another presser. And you know what? Dopamine sucks. It is a murder drug. Stop using it for anybody. If you are gonna use a presser, that drug better ride with menopreferin. That, that's the drugs you want, okay? I don't care if it's norepi or epi, don't care. This study actually looks at epi, do not care. Very unclear whether which one's better, which one's, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Stop using dopamine. We already know in adults that it's associated with more dysrhythmias because it makes the heart go faster. You're more likely to push them into AFib or VTAC, things like that. It's associated with higher mortality in both adults and kids. Most of the time in adults, we're not using it anymore. It's still being used in kids, and I have no clue why. This drug needs to go away. If this is the only presser in your Apixis, you need to talk to somebody. So, I love coffee. It might be apparent to you guys from hearing me talk that I've already had a little bit of it. <laughs> My coffee to sleep ratio is pretty high right now. So, this was great. They actually took 200,000 health professionals, got a bunch of doctors, nurses, and whatnot. And they said, how much coffee do you drink? And then watch to see if they died, okay? It turns out, and this is crazy, one to five cups of coffee. It wasn't just like, did you have a cup or two? It was up to five cups a day was the best mortality group. The people that drank over five cups a day, and I'm kind of worried about those guys, <laughs> those people actually still had a mortality benefit compared to those teetotalers that never have any coffee who are not to be trusted. Uh, <laughs> but it, uh, ironically, decaf is still better than, uh, than not drinking any coffee at all. 
So even if you're like, oh, I don't want to, no, at least have a cup of decaf, guys. So this is definitely for my health. So next up, peripheral pressors, okay? So I just said you can't use dopamine. And historically, people give dopamine through a peripheral IV and pretend like that was okay, and it's garbage. Let me show you what you should do instead. So do not wait for pressors. I totally get it that some of you guys are in shops where either you're uncomfortable placing a central line or the ICU folks play central line or you don't have time for central line. Great, okay? I get the reality. You should get comfortable with ultrasound. There are plenty of ways to safely place central lines. It's okay if you have to do a femoral line. That's all right, okay? Just do it clean, it's okay. But if you are stuck trying to give pressors to someone that's got a peripheral IV, here's what you can do. You can just give the presser anyway through the IV. Just start the drip. This is safest the more proximal the line is. So if it's proximal, either the AC or closer, they almost never have any trouble. I prefer not to do it in the legs, definitely don't do it in the foot, okay? This is not the 22 gauge and the pinky finger, but it is actually quite safe. This is bad data. This is not a randomized control trial. This is observational and case report. But almost every time they got in trouble, it happened when you did it distally, so little bitty ones out in the periphery, or if you left it in for over four hours, okay? It is totally safe for you to admit them upstairs and have someone else put a central line in if you're uncomfortable for any reason or can't do it for some reason. Just start the pressures. It's far better than them being hypotensive. So don't delay it for the central line. So let's talk about how to mix push dose epi. This is one of my biggest practice changes in the last couple of years. I'm in love with this stuff. Sometimes starting a, a, a presser drip, a lot of nursing intensive labor, you gotta get the pump out and all this other stuff, doesn't work so great. So what can you do? You can actually mix a syringe that you're able to push at the bedside and administer yourself. So what do you do? You get some crash card epi, okay? This is one to 10,000 epi. You get a saline flush and a blunt needle. That's all you need, okay? So what do you do? You squirt one ml of normal saline on the floor or at your favorite nurse. Then you draw up one ml of that epi into it, okay? So now we've got this syringe. It's got one ml of crash card epi, the one to 10,000 stuff with nine mls of normal saline. Now you shake it up just like a cocktail, okay? Now you've taken that one to 10,000 and turned it into one to 100,000. This is incredibly safe stuff. And the reason I know it's incredibly safe is even if it extravasates, how many of you guys use lidocaine with epi? right? The concentration of epinephrine in that lidocaine with epi is one to a hundred thousand. So in the same way that you're comfortable shooting five mls of that straight into someone's arm, if the IV blows and this goes in someone's arm, they're not going to die, okay? It's going to be totally safe because it's diluted. Now you label it because that syringe is identical to normal saline, okay? You can give up to two mls of this every two minutes as needed, titrating to effect. I use this stuff all the time. I mix it up before I ever intubate anybody that is hypotensive. If there's ever a procedural sedation I'm doing, I'm a little bit worried. Have a syringe in your pocket. Do not put this on the table. It goes in your pocket. It does not go anywhere else because it looks just like regular saline. This is my last section before I have to close out. So apneic oxygenation. Show of hands, how many people are putting um, oxygen on their patients before they intubate? So pre-oxygenating. How many people are leaving a nasal cannula in while you tube? Okay, I hope next year to see all of you guys, and I hope that everyone's hand goes up. Let's talk about it. First off, a little trigger warning here. Okay, I don't normally believe in these, but I think it's merited. There's a clown coming up. You want to put some O's up the nose, okay? So what you're going to do is basically put a nasal cannula on while you're pre-oxygenating the patient. You're going to turn it up. It doesn't really matter how high it is while they're awake, but once they go under, I put it up to at least 15 liters. You can actually crank it higher. It's going to continue to provide oxygen while you're intubating them, while they're apneic. The data is not great, but there's this one study here that was actually in the emergency department that doubled your likelihood of actually getting an intubation without hypoxia on your first shot. Okay? There is no downside. That plastic was already spent because almost all these people have it anyway. Just hook it up to oxygen, crank it up, and then tube them. It will not interfere at all with anything else that you're doing. This can stay on while you're putting in an LMA, while you're intubating, while you're criking them. It doesn't matter but their sats stay up longer. So summary, opioids are deadly. Stop giving long courses of it. Try to avoid giving to anybody that doesn't really need it. If you get in trouble, knife to neck is the only way to crack someone. Throw away that needle kit. Juice is tastier than salt water. In case you weren't aware of that, get rid of your Pedialyte. Abnic oxygenation is the only way that I intubate people and get comfortable with push dose pressers because it will definitely save your bacon, even if that bacon doesn't go up someone's nose. There's all my slides. Thank you. <laughs>